Thank you for joining us. This teaching series on Christian theology is taught by our head pastor, Chris Walden. For more information, visit us at firstrockfellowship.org. All right, well, how about we pray and we can get started tonight. Lord, thank you for allowing each of us to be in your house tonight. Yes. We welcome your spirit. Amen. Lord, as we open your word, we pray that you would give us understanding. Yes, Lord. Lord. Yes. You are a God who is yes, beyond our understanding, except yes. that you reveal yourself to us. And so, Lord, we ask that you would yes. reveal yourself to us, that you would reveal your ways, that, Lord, you would help us understand your word. Amen. And, uh, what you want us to know from tonight. Amen. We do pray for these other classes meeting. We lift up um, the discipleship class happening down the hall. We pray that you would uh, help them to grow in the faith and the word. And we pray, Lord, for all the children and the youth tonight that you would minister to them as well. Help us all to know you and to love you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. Well, uh, the last time that I was here, we finished up the three offices of Christ, the prophet, the priest, and the king, and I told you we would start the stages of the work of Christ when I got back, and we're going to kind of uh, very briefly talk about the Incarnation because we have talked about it a lot. In fact, I thought maybe we even got into a part of that that last time. We might have done Incarnation and the Death of Christ. No, we were moving into the Death. We're moving into death. Okay, I thought we had done the incarnation. So, um, basically, we're going to look at a couple of verses on the death of Christ. We all know what he died, but we're doing systematic theology. We're going to look at a couple of verses that show where the scripture says that he died. And the reason we're doing this is because these are the stages of the work of Christ. And Christ dying is a part of the work that he did. It's understanding the fullness of what Christ came to do. His job was to uh, come and, and, first of all, humble himself. This is, uh, he, we're talking about the humiliation. The first part of his humiliation was that he humbled himself and he became a man. So going from God on the throne to becoming a man is, a, is, is humbling, okay? The second stage of the humiliation of the, of the work of Christ is that he dies, all right? So let's, uh, would somebody like to look up Matthew 26, 68? Sure. All right, Jerry. And then uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 25 through 27. You want to for that one? All right, thank you, Debbie. You say 26, 68? 26, 68. Okay. Yeah, from Matthew. Well, well, let's just start with those two. I'm ready for you are. All right, go ahead. Now, Peter... I'm sorry, I got the right way. Yes, 26 days. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and the servant girl came to him. You also were Jesus of Galilee, Galilee, she said. Is that the right one? Let's see. It should be Matthew 26, 68. That's what, right. That's what it says. I'm, I'm getting in myself. I was behind you. Mine says the same prophecy unto huh? us. Mine says the same prophecy unto us, thou Christ. Well, I'm on the wrong one. We see this monkey. Well, I don't understand it. 2668. 2667 somewhere. Yeah, 2668. I don't know. Huh. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, I went to 69. And it said prophecy to us, Messiah, who, who hit you. That's what that said. Yeah. That's still not what transport. That's still what transport is it. Matthew 27, verse 45. Somewhere in that vicinity. Yeah, from the sixth hour to ninth. Twenty-seven uh, forty-five. Then he is basically. If you go to Matthew twenty-seven, I don't know why Matthew twenty-six. I must have mistyped it or. Um, but we have where he died. Uh, no matter what, if we go over to Matthew twenty-seven, <laughs> we're going to see where he was crucified on the cross, and his death happens from verse forty-five, following. Uh, verse 50 says, And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Yes, yes. All right, so we have a uh, passage that he died. Luke 23. Let's read that one, see if it's right. Okay. 
that, that was I funny. usually always pre-read every verse and more, and I didn't do that. I thought we might have got past that. I, I focused on the descent in the 80s for tonight, but go ahead. And he released them, and he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Now he was let, they you know, now as they laid him away, they laid hold of, hold of a certain man, Simon, uh, sorry, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented out, lamented. All right, so again, we've got part of the scene of him dying. And I'm wondering if that Matthew 26 went out when we said 68, which is what I wrote in here. I wonder if it was 66 because it says um, he is worthy of death. Uh, yeah. What do you think he is worthy of death? So I'm sure that's probably the one that um, yeah, we're okay. supposed to have. But no matter what, we looked at three passages. And like I said, this is not something we need to go over and over. We, we really are confident that Jesus died on the cross. And that is a part of him being humble. So let's move now uh, into uh, the topic that is uh, controversial to some theologians. Uh, whether or not Jesus descended uh, into hell, as some say, or Hades, or uh, we'll find, we're going to look at what the literal word is in the Hebrew and talk about that. But let's let's start with uh, Psalm sixteen ten. Who would like to look up that verse? Right, My dad has got that one. The next one is uh, Ephesians chapter. Well, let me hold on. There was some more I was going to add that I didn't write down. For you guys. Um, yeah, Ephesians four eight through ten. Anybody want that one? I'll do it. Okay. Okay. You write once this time. Yeah, I looked. It is. I looked all these up. I'm sorry, what was it? Ephesians what? Ephesians four, eight through ten. Okay, gotcha. And uh, we're not going to read the First Timothy one because it doesn't do any help to us. Uh, Psalm thirty, verse three is another one. All right, thank you, Debbie. And then the last one we're going to read on this is First Peter three, eighteen through nineteen. Okay, so uh, let's begin with, uh, and we're going to do both of the Psalms together, uh, Psalm 1610 and Psalm 30, verse 3, so I'll give it to a little out of word. So let's go ahead and start with Psalm 1610. Is that you have? Yes. Okay. Psalms uh, 30? 1610. 1610. Yeah. Okay. Well, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. All right, so uh, King James and uh, some other versions interpret the word as hell. The word in the Hebrew there is shale. The word shale uh, literally, literally means the underworld or the grave, the place of the dead. Um, as, since we went through Revelations as a class, we know that hell is a different destination than the grave. Hell is a final place of judgment that uh, is awaiting those who will be cast there uh, at the end after the white room judgment. But Sheol is a place all through the Old Testament that's referred to, and in Hades it's used in the New Testament as well. Hades is never a place where righteous dead go, but where wicked dead go. Hell is a final place, and as I explained, Back when we were going through the book of Revelation, Hades is like uh, going to the county jail. Hell is like getting the life sentence at the prison. It's, an, it's the long forever thing, and, it, and it's the big house. So, all right? So we're talking about the word, though, because it's really important to go back to our original language. And the original language is shale. And so though at different times in history, different words have been put in there, some of our versions today would say, uh, you want to abandon me to the grave. Um, some of yours may say something else, um, like hell, the grave, other words that are similar to that. 
but uh, the Hebrew word is shale. And if we're going to go off the most literal, we, we need to understand it as more of the underworld where the dead go. So whenever Samuel, the prophet, dies, where is he at? And he's righteous, by the way. The Hebrew word that describes where Samuel, the prophet, was at was shale. All right? Which means it would not be hell uh, because hell would be a place of judgment. It wouldn't even be Hades because Samuel was a righteous prophet. So we, that, what we're understanding is the Hebrew word can mean a place where the dead in general are held, not just the wicked dead. All right? So understanding that will help us as we go through this process. So um, because even the writer of this theology book, I'm going to... I'm going to tell you what he says, but I don't agree with him on a lot of things he says on this subject. You can make your own choice and your own, your own decisions, and um, that's the freedom of being a believer and reading God's Word. But um, I, I like going off what the Word says, and when I look at it, I just don't agree with the explaining away of some things here. So I would rather go with what the Word says. So, let's go back to the Word. It says, because you will not abandon me to Sheol. The grave, the, the place of the dead. You're not going to abandon me, today, nor will you let your holy one see decay. Who is the holy one? Jesus, right? And so, in capitals, in my Bible, might be in yours as well. It's it's speaking of Christ. And why? How was this verse fulfilled? How was this prophecy fulfilled? He was resurrected. Yes, Jesus died, didn't he? When he died, three days, he's dead. Three days. Where is Jesus? We know where His body is. It's put in a tomb, right? But where is Jesus? Where is the soul of Jesus at? It'd be in Sheol, in the grave. This is what we're seeing here. Because you will not abandon me to Sheol. So abandon means you're there, but you're not going to be left there, right? You, you can't be abandoned somewhere you've never been. Abandoned means you're there, but you're not going to be left there. So he goes down into Sheol. But, and, and some would even say, and this is where this theologian would say, well, Sheol can mean death. But it is, we, we understand that when we die, we, we don't just die and become nothing and go nowhere. When we die, our soul goes somewhere. We, as we were talking about with Samuel the prophet, he was in jail. He went to a place. A place. And he's called up from that place and woke up when uh, Saul the king has the witch and Endor uh, by divina divination bring him up from the grave and he's bothered about it. And it was illegal. God has always said, do not do that. Don't speak to the dead. Necromancy is a sin Divination is a sin. All that stuff is a sin. So, I believe that the grave, the shale, is a place that the righteous, the unrighteous, in the Old Testament times can go to. And that when Jesus died on the cross, He, for three days, went into the grave, into shale. Alright? So, we... I think we have that just in Psalm 16.10. And, 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 and just to, to be fair, what this theologian believes is for three days he was dead. But he don't want to say that he went anywhere. But he was just dead. And then he rose. But I think it's, there's a lot of evidence. So we can even see it in Jesus in the New Testament when he's telling parables and he talks about the rich man and Lazarus. That's right. What does he say? When Lazarus dies, where does he does he just die? No. No. When he dies, he goes somewhere, right? That's right. When the rich man dies, does he just die? No. It he says he goes somewhere. Where did Lazarus go? To Abraham's bosom. That's right. There's a place where he was comforted and at peace. Where did the rich man go? He went to a place of torment where he could see Lazarus, but Lazarus couldn't see him. Yeah. And he cried out for someone to go witness to his family, which means he's in this place while his family are on earth. Now, Jesus is... This is not a parable. Parables don't use names of people. Parables are generalities. But when a name is used, now this is what most theologians teach, when a name is used, you're getting a 
historical event with real people. Yeah. Lazarus is a real person. And the rich man was a real person who had ignored him all his life when he begged at his gate. So we've got, we, we may not have the clearest of picture of what will happen, but here's where we are so far. We're, we're into one verse. And I think because we pull from what Jesus is saying, which there's a lot of authority in what Jesus says, He has been there. He created it all. He knows what happens. And before He dies, He talks about these things. He says, Lazarus goes here, rich man goes here. What did He say about the thief on the cross that died beside Him? Today, you will today, be today with you'll be with me in paradise, right? right? So He didn't say, today you'll die. And someday, you'll be resurrected. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. When we die, there is an immediate somewhere, and I know there's a lot of mystery around this. Yeah. And I've tried to explain the best way that I can explain it. And I, when I say it, I say it knowing that I could be wrong. But I haven't heard anything that I like better yet. But the, the best thing I can come up with is that the soul... Because that's the word used a lot when we see uh, the soul going uh, into the grave. Right? That's what we see. That's the word used. But when we see the Spirit mentioned uh, when someone dies, even Jesus dying on the cross, which we read just a minute ago, it says that His Spirit left Him. And, and the Spirit seems to ascend. Go back to the Father. And when we read Ecclesiastes, it says that the Spirit of man returns to that from which he came. He turns to God. Uh, the body returns to the dust, Ecclesiastes says, but the spirit returns to God. And so what I what I wonder is, and what I've said before to you, and I forgive me if it's repetition to you, but how is it that someone can today be with me in paradise, immediate in one way, uh, be with the Lord, with me in paradise, and yet be waiting for a bodily resurrection with a spiritual body. And the only way I can come up with that is that we are three parts. And that the soul is awaiting the spiritual the resurrection with a new body. Because that is highly biblical. Very biblical. So sound that we are awaiting a resurrection. Jesus was the first to be raised. And we will rise as well with a new body. Yes. Right? So we know that. So we can't deny that. But we also can't deny that today you'll be with me in paradise. We can't deny that uh, Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom while the rich man's family is on earth sinning. And he's saying, please send someone to him. So we've got what we could say are conflicting things, but I don't think they have to be conflicting. I think there are ways that we could that might possibly answer that. And one would be, the soul's in one place and the spirit is another. The, the Bible says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword and is able to divide a joint and marrow, soul and spirit. Yes. Which shows they can be divided, but only God can do such a thing. Right. That's the only explanation I've had. I've, I've shared that with the professor. Uh, he, of course, believed in dualism, that we were just a body and a soul-spirit thing. So my argument didn't mean anything to him. And that was okay because his argument didn't mean anything to me. <laughs> we loved each other. And he's the one going to keep you out of heaven. Nobody's get, he's not going to keep us out of heaven. Not yet. <laughs> and I know I could be wrong, and I'm sure he knew he could be wrong too, but you got to hold what you That's hold to and believe what you believe Amen. at that point in your life. And yes. Maybe change your mind as you keep growing, right? Sure. You can so, agree to disagree. That's exactly right. And it was a very, believe me, I had tremendous respect for him. I just, yeah. I just shared my opinion with him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Let's move on to the uh, Psalm 30. because we, We've talked about a lot of verses that I didn't have to read. They're just kind of coming to my mind while we read our first one. Psalm 30. I got it. Okay, thank you. Verse Oh Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pits. All right, thank you. So again, in that Psalm 30, verse 3, O oh Lord, you brought me up from... That word is shale. I looked it up. That's why I have this up in case you question me. <laughs> I can show you the Hebrew word in the Hebrew letters, everything. The word is shale there. So it's the O oh Lord, you brought me up from shale, the place of the dead. You spared me from going down into the pit. 
Uh, so from, from remaining there, as the other one said, uh, you didn't abandon me there, but you, you brought me up from it. Amen. All right? So uh, that was just another Old Testament one, and we get the word shale in those two passages uh, regarding uh, the Messiah and him not being left or abandoned in shale, but being brought up. So let's move now uh, to our verse, let's see, Ephesians 4. 8 through 10. Okay, I'm going to start at 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What, what does he ascended mean except he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who had descended is the very one who ascended high in all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Alright. With respect to Brother Erickson, <laughs> who you know, I, I, I've read this book twice through now, and or all, I read it all the way through once for sure, and I've read most of it through twice because of this class. <laughs> I, I love the guy, and I, I share with you tremendous things, but uh, I, this one area, I just struggle with his explanations because I feel like it's, there's more of a, a, a trying to explain away, and some of these, yeah, they may not be the strongest evidence, but there's a we are moving toward even stronger evidence. The last passage we'll look at is the one that he says is a difficult passage. Well, it's only difficult because he's trying to explain away every other passage. So, without trying to be disrespectful at all, let me share with you what uh, he would say about this Ephesians passage. He would say that when it says uh, that. Uh, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave, gave gifts to men. And then it goes down to verse 9 and says, What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? All right. So what he's saying, and, and I, for a long time I didn't argue with that at all. It's only when I start putting other scriptures together that I start saying, Well, wait a minute, I don't know that the interpretation you're giving works when you look at other passages. Uh, I could easily go along with what he says about this one passage if it weren't for other passages. But this one passage, he says, well, what he's talking about, he's saying ascended higher uh, than the heavens. Or uh, when he ascended on high, and he led captives, it said, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? And then verse 10, he also descended, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher in all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So what he's saying is, well, if he ascended higher than all the heavens, all right, then when it says he descended to the lower earthly regions, it's just saying that he descended to earth. For a long time I thought, well, that makes sense. Why should we say and make the verse say that that means he went into the grave? If it's talking about he went up into the heavens, well then yes, descending could be just the earth, right? Makes sense. But when I look at verses like Psalm 1610, Psalm 30, verse 3, and especially when we get to the passage that's going to be read by Tiffany in a minute, when you start putting other scriptures, and remember what systematic theology is, it's understanding theology, all of scripture, letting verses, all of verses talk before we develop a doctrine. So we don't develop a doctrine based on one passage, we put it all together. So I'm like Mr. Uh, Erickson here. I easily had no problem when I first read what he wrote about that of saying, well, that makes sense. And, and so why would somebody be making that say he went into the grave? But we've got other places that say he went into the grave. He went into Sheol. So um, I, I, if it weren't for the other places, that you could, you could make that one say something different. But... Um, it, at, at the very least, we have to look at this passage and say, no one can say that it's only the surface of the earth. Just like no one can say absolutely that that verse <coughs> means he went all the way to the grave. But, when you put other verses with it, then I think you can, you can say, well, because of other scriptures, we believe he went into the grave. He went all the way down into shame, right? Because of other scriptures. But that verse alone doesn't give us enough. 
It's not enough to say He didn't, and it's not enough to say He did. But knowing the other verses, we can use it and, and put it together. Does that make sense? Because what I want us to all be careful of is to not be guilty of reading a verse and saying, well, I'm just going to decide that means this because I think that way. I don't want you to think like that. I don't want you to operate like that. And I shouldn't operate like that. The only reason that I'm going to stand out and say I believe it means all the way to grave is because I have other passages that give me that evidence and that information. Um, if I didn't have those, I would be guilty of making the passage say more than it's saying. Does that make sense? Yes, I'd be reading into it my opinion, and I want to be very careful not to do that. Now, all of us who are going into God's Word, we are going to have our opinion. We're going to see things the way we see it and interpret the way we interpret it. But to be responsible in our hermeneutics, which is a word that just means the way that we interpret, if we're going to handle the Word rightly, like God tells us to, then we want to look at what does the language tell us? What does the Bible tell us? Not what do I want it to say. Not, not I was always taught this, so it has to say what I was always taught. But no, I want to look at the Bible and ask the Spirit of God to show me what the Word of God is saying. That should do, that The Word of God should tell me what to believe about God, not me telling it what I believe about God. Right? I shouldn't twist it, change it, put spin on it, add to it, or take away from it. I should let it speak for itself. Amen. And with the help of uh, you know, men and women of the faith, teachers of the past and present, the Spirit of God, uh, using the, the original languages and Bible extension and other things, we use lots of helps, but we still have to pray and go at it and let it say what it's saying Amen. without Amen. messing with it. Okay? Alright, so... Uh, that's about all we can get out of that one is that it does say uh, that He, uh, what does it mean He ascended except that He also descended to the lower earthly regions. And, and I would add to this, I think that one could say why was the word lower added when He could have said descended to the earthly regions. Yes, that's right. When you say the lower earthly regions, I think... When you add it to Psalm 1610 and Psalm 30 verse 3, lower can mean shale, right? right? It can mean the grave. It can actually be saying it right there because it could have been left out. You could say he descended to earth. You don't have to say the lower earthly regions. That's right. And a region of earth, a lower region of earth, again, why put lower and region around earth? You're adding words. Why would you add words except that you're giving more specific definition to the place? So I think there is a lot there, even though some theologians would say, oh, you're reading more into it than it's there. I'm really trying to be very honest. I think the passage says it. Yeah, very I really do. Yeah. I think it says it. Um, and, I, and I think you, if you come to it not believing you went to Sheol, uh, then yes, you may try to argue your way around it. But I, I think, I'm trying to read it as straightforward as it says it. And, and I think we've got multiple reasons for believing even Ephesians 4 gives evidence. It and makes you wonder reason. why they don't want to believe that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure why. I don't know. It makes you wonder. <laughs> because they, they, Erickson's a sound guy. Yeah, and so I understand. He, he knows that he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose from the grave. He, I know he would know that. Yeah. You know, that's, he wouldn't... This yeah. wouldn't be in our seminary if he didn't. Oh, we all have, um, we all have something. But there are different. Yeah. For whatever reason. And I think he's just trying to be very, stick right by the scripture. But sometimes yeah. you can think you're sticking by it and not. Yeah. Um, because of what you've been taught or what's in your background. We all come to the scripture with some biases. That's, That's just right. humanity. That's right. That's you know? right. So we, we have to try to watch our own biases. Okay. So now let's move on. Uh, to the big verse, the one that even Eric's and has trouble with. First Peter 3, 18 through 19. And uh, then we'll probably after that uh, we'll read verse uh, chapter 4, verse 4 through 6, since you're already there. Okay. Everybody might want to turn to this one because we're going to be here for a little bit. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 19. Start, or you want me to yeah, go ahead and start. Thank you. For indeed Christ died for sins once for all, the just and the righteous, for the unjust and the unrighteous, so that he might bring us to 
God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and he preached to the spirits now in prison. Do you want me to read 20 where it talks about? Yeah. Okay. That's important. Okay. <laughs> we want to know who's in prison. Maybe, maybe yeah. even 21. Yeah, go ahead and read okay. 21 too. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'm going to start back at 19. Okay. In which he also went and preached to the spirits now in prison who once were disobedient when the great patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, Noah's family, were brought safely through the water corresponding to that baptism now saves you not by removing dirt from the body but by an appeal to God for the for a good and clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, angels and glory, right? So we're kind of what a subject, right? This is why the, even the writer here who, who's been arguing against every text for him going into, and really to be, to be straightforward, he's, he's, he's saying he doesn't go into hell, okay? And he doesn't go into hell. He goes into shale. He goes into the grave. Um, but what, what chapter 3 is talking about, because what he struggles with, the theologian struggles with, is that he went and he preached to people and he, what all might have happened there? Because that's the whole the, the whole doctrine is that he descended into Hades or descended into the grave. Um, that's where he's struggling. This passage, uh, let's begin to just break it down. We first of all, the very clear part: he died for our sins once for all. Doesn't need to keep redying. Uh, the righteous being Jesus, for the unrighteous being us. To bring us to God. Very clear. That's a gospel message right there. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. And Romans 8 says the same thing. That Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what the Bible tells us. Amen. He was raised from the dead by the power that's of right. the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right? So that's what Peter's telling us. He says he was put to death in the body, but he was made alive by the Spirit. Through whom? All right. And and, 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 and by the way, I like because when I was reading in an NASB, uh, it says like yours. Uh, what, what version do you use? Mine's Amplified. Yours Amplified. Uh, it says he was made alive in the Spirit, not by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right. But either one would be true because in, in Romans 8, it says by the power of the Spirit he was raised. But it says, uh, made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Okay, so it's telling us that by or through the Holy Spirit, Jesus went and preached to these spirits in prison. Yeah. And we're, we might, if we didn't go on and read the next verse, be saying, what spirits? Who are they? Where did they come from? Right? If he didn't tell us more. But he goes on and makes this can of worms even bigger. Yeah. Because now he tells us who these spirits are. They are those who disobeyed in the days of Noah. Remember yeah. that almost 2,000 years, well, about 1,500 years, pretty close in that area, uh, goes by before the flood happens. You've got a lot of evil. The world became so wicked and so evil, and there was only one righteous man found, Noah, and he and his family were saved, right? Yeah. Everybody else was wicked, and everybody else was destroyed yeah. by the flood. The whole world was full of wickedness. They disobeyed, even though God waited patiently. He gave them almost 1,500 years or so there for them to turn and repent, and they did not. So it says that these are the spirits that are in prison. Prison, uh, even, even the Hebrew word there, uh, it, it says prison or a holding place. Um, is it Shale? Maybe. Is it Hades? Probably. <laughs> and 
It's a it's a holy place. And when did Jesus go? When did he go? There's some interpretation that could be it was even before it was incarnate. Right. Just by this same spirit, sometime in the past he went. There. Yes, and that's but that's what makes this verse so confusing. Right, that's what, you know, he gave the Lutheran view, he gives lots of different views in here because there's a Catholic view, there's a Lutheran view, there's different views, and one of them is what John just said, and that is that uh, he went, uh, it's possible that he went even before he was incarnate. And I believe the Catholic view was uh, more tying it to um, uh, the belief in um, purgatory. Yes, the word wasn't coming to me. So, um, you've got different ideas. And this verse is where different denominations, different faiths, different believers, it's where they, they, they build a doctrine out of. And like John said, and like this writer said, this is a confusing passage, which is why we have some pretty uh, varying interpretations of it. Uh, because we're all trying to understand what does it mean? Um, what, what is it talking about? I think it's, we're always, like I said a minute ago, we're always best to stay as close to what it says and not build anything beyond what the Word says. Um, and, and what it's telling us is that, and this is why I would say that uh, this is speaking of when He dies on the cross that He goes. Because that's the subject. That's the context that we find it in. It, to, to say... We know that Jesus, remember verse 18, Christ died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous in the body. He was put to death in the body. What are we talking about? This is all incarnation. He is, he is uh, in the body, put to death in the body, made alive by the Spirit. We're watching something happen here in an order. And then that we're in the same Spirit. Didn't even put a period in there. The flow of the sentence is, He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom He also went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now, I realize if someone wants to, they can say, well, uh, the through whom is referring to a whole other point in history. And, and, and that's, again, all of our freedom. You want to believe that? It's, it's, it's your freedom. I, I like to stay within what I see the context of the passage. And the context is uh, that He, he dies... And he's buried, and the Spirit uh, takes him also, and went and he preached to those who were disobedient uh, long ago in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. Um, here's the other reason I think him not going until he has died on the cross and is about to be resurrected, because preaching to them. 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years after, after they died, what, what good is that? They didn't believe when they were, you know, 4,500 years before Christ. They weren't righteous. What good news is He preaching? And by the word, preached, is that word, the Greek word there that's used, is the word, everywhere that word is used, it always refers to the gospel in the New Testament. All right? So when Jesus preached, you've got a word that it is being used there that always refers to the preaching of the good of the good news, the gospel. All right? So you don't have the gospel until Jesus dies on the cross, is buried, and rises again. So again, I would say. That's why I, me personally, when, when I'm looking at this and I'm trying to interpret this difficult passage, I'm going to lean toward that He died on the cross, He buried and, and went into the grave. And who's awaiting in the grave? Well, we know the rich man is there, right? Uh, he's, in, uh, he's in Hades. He's, he's, he's down there in a place of suffering, waiting. Uh, we know that sin... Samuel was in Sheol, the grave. We know there's people in the grave, right? So if Jesus goes into the grave, there's people in the grave. We would not have known there was any preaching going on. And, and the, the odd thing about this that maybe even adds more question marks to it is um, why did he only 
Why does it specifically say he preached to those who disobeyed long ago in the days that the ark was being built? And if they're Why already does he lost, preach to everybody? Huh? And if they're already lost, what good is it? it, it and, and that's the other question is, um, and I think that's why, you know, a writer like this begins to really argue this and that interpretation. And I think the reason is because they don't want a doctrine beginning to come out that says we can now, uh, those who have died without Jesus, uh -huh. have a second chance. Because that's not scriptural. Yes. Okay. So, in my, my opinion, I, I'm thinking... There, there may have been something about pre-flood that caused God to show grace Amen. and preach the gospel to them. I don't know. Yeah. And I don't know why. I don't have any, don't any idea. But I know that after the flood, after Noah, Noah is... Oh gosh, I had another Bible. I've written notes. I've added it all up. Noah is... I think he's the... I know he's still alive when Abraham is born. He's old. He's the great, great, great grandfather. Right. Um, but he is still alive. He's alive for like 40 years, 50 years um, when Abraham was alive. Noah was 950. Yes, he lived to be 950. And when Abraham was born, um, that was the old of their age is about 50 years. Something like that. That was on that chart we had on the wall that showed that. Yes, yeah, and that chart's at my house right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think the homes wouldn't get damaged by it's it. Right. Through it's yours. <laughs> um, so I always, when I look at that, because I look at how long Adam lived, and I look at how long, uh, you know, that Methuselah and the crossover, uh, these, these yeah. guys who lived nearly a thousand years, um, there was only like three two to three people that from Adam up to Abraham that, that knew these things because Noah knew uh, Methuselah very well. It was his grandfather. Yeah. And I mean, he, he, well, died, he died in his flood storm. Yes. And his father was taken. taken so right. So right. He Enoch last, was taken. The last righteous man, yeah. Methuselah, Enoch, and, and Noah. Exactly. Yeah, the other two were gone. Exactly. Methuselah was around a long time with Noah. I mean, with uh, with Adam, and then so he could have heard from Adam, and then passed on to Noah. Noah is the only one that survives the flood outside of his sons. But Noah didn't have his sons till he was seven hundred or something, I think. And so uh, Noah would have known Methuselah. But when the time of the flood comes, the boys are not going to have known him very long if they did. So. Noah carries the knowledge. If you say, well, how does anybody know what happened with Adam and Eve? Well, that's why. Because Methuselah was alive while Adam was alive. And Adam easily could have shared and probably did because the only way anything got passed down was by verbal. That's it. So he tells the story. Methuselah carries it with him and, and literally lives for several hundred years with Noah, 700-ish before the flood happens, right? And then you've got Noah going through the flood and bringing it into this new world. And there's something... I'm just going off the Scripture because I don't know what else to say. For some reason, pre-flood gets preached to here. Post-flood does not. Yeah. And I don't know why. Anybody ever heard a reasoning by that? In your readings? Or? What do you think happened when he preached to those people? What did they do? What I don't know. purpose? Well, I, I would think the only reason you would ever preach is that there is the hope of someone yeah. believing, right? But did that? Well, we don't. Unless you go back and see the Ephesians 4, the leading, the training, the oh, captives. Wow. Yeah. Captives are people who are in prison. So it's possible that some believed and were led. I don't know. We're, we're definitely <laughs> guessing. You know, the pre flood people would not have had any idea of God's plan for salvation. No. So, perhaps, I mean, post flood, you get all the prophets, everybody knows that there is a salvation coming. Yeah. So, Even Abraham has a covenant and God's saying things. Yeah. So, it's yes. possible that he just wanted to cover that base so that no one could accuse him of not being a good God. Right. Well, he is a just God. Yeah. No matter what anybody thinks about him, he is a just God. Yeah, so yeah. If, if justice requires him, to have preached to them because they had no other except creation. 
Tiffany, go ahead. I'm sorry. I have a small rabbit hole, but I think it pertains to what John was saying. I've been studying Genesis, and there's a lot of things kind of went on a rabbit trail about the gospel and the stars. Have you ever studied that at all? What I'm finding is that in what has been so paganized, mm -hmm. you know, um, astrology, paganized, but that those symbols in the, in the sky, um, like your Virgo and that kind of thing, that it actually if you look at the Hebrew names, because God named all the stars, if you look at the Hebrew names of those stars, that it actually preaches the gospel. Wow. And it's just been completely paganized over time. But in like the teaching that I've been kind of going through, mm -hmm. talks about how um, God very possibly used that as an instrument to preach the full gospel to Adam and you know, and then that went through Noah because they used the oral tradition, but that they would teach using those Hebrew names. Anyway. Yeah. I, I just thought that was interesting. Sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, I've never heard that, so it's interesting to think about that. I mean, you know, you, you got Pisces, and I know uh, the age of Aquarius and all that, and it's definitely been pagan, out in, yeah. in a very bad way. <laughs> but uh, all of God's creation was meant to glorify God. So uh, God doesn't put the stars up there to lead men astray. He puts them up there he, for no other reason the beauty to display His glory mm -hmm. and to draw men to Him. So if there's even more in that because prophesying. Job mentions Orion. Mm -hmm. So that would have yes. been between And Job Noah is one of the oldest books of the Bible. Abraham, yeah. yeah. Job is around in the days when there were giant beasts, uh, dragons. Uh, you've got you got beasts of the sea that we've never seen. Job talked about as though they were common. Everybody knew what they were in Job's opinion. Right. So Job goes way back, and, and I, I noticed that as well when I went through Job that I was I was amazed that he was referring to things that we might think are just a bunch of as, as astrology stuff that is pagan, but Job is referring to these, which means that man saw these images in the stars that far back. Yeah. It was very interesting how God is revealing. Um, I didn't know there was Hebrew names for it. I hadn't really even thought about yeah, that. Yeah, like they don't actually look like the pictures that they're supposed to look like, but it's saying that if you go by the, the Hebrew names of the stars, that it'll specifically lay out the gospel, the whole story. Wow. wow. Yeah, the stars with look Virgo that and it ends with Leo. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Do you think about yeah, Leo? You, the line of the line of Judah. Christ, yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. We could chase a lot right there. We'll stop. <laughs> okay, because uh, I don't know what I'm talking about, so I'm not going to say anything about it. But, okay. Um, so basically, we we still we're we're not coming in here. This this you know our our, our old class here at First Rock Fellowship in Aubrey, Texas, and we're not going to solve all the problems with this past today that theologians for thousands of years have not been able to say, we're not going to fix it all and walk out of your sand. I don't know why they couldn't see that, right? We, we're going to leave with questions. We're going to leave maybe with uh, what we think is right. We're still going to leave with some mysteries. This is not an easy passage. Do we know why? We don't know why. That Why does it say uh, that he preached to those spirits in prison? But if the word preached means the gospel, which in every other case it does, and for some reason, he shares the gospel, and he does it by the power of the Spirit of God, and it is uh, takes him uh, down uh, to those who are in prison, um, captives, as Ephesians would say. Um, and definitely, these are people who are dead. <laughs> Nobody who died in the flood is still alive. They are dead, but they are existing. A soul and a spirit are eternal things. They do not... Uh, we don't believe in annihilation as Christians. We uh, that's a those are doctrines of other religions. Yeah. We don't believe in annihilation. We believe that the soul exists for eternity, either in heaven with God or in hell, and separated from God in eternal punishment. But we don't want to believe that you just are annihilated and you know you go out of existence. That is not a biblical doctrine. And so you can see here that uh, these folks died in the flood um, 
And at whatever point you want to believe he preached to them, he went and he preached to them. And the preaching would have been the gospel. So I, that's again, I think, gives credit to this to the timeline of it happening at the event of, of his uh, incarnation, death, and burial. Um, all right, so those are the big verses. That's the big controversial subject. I don't know where you land on it. Does anybody? Oh, let's go to chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 4 through 6. There's a little bit more that we can read. Um, I said, I've been reading that. You've been reading? Oh. Yeah. Right. Um, in regard to these, <clears throat> they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same blood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they may be judged according to the men of the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Verse beautiful. What is my status, Christ, and suffer? <laughs> <laughs> I like the way he reads better. I didn't understand. He's all fancy. Um, okay, so let me read it in the NIV. Okay. It, it sounds a little bit simpler, maybe, and might help us because this yeah. is. All right, so verse 6 says, For this reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Again, uh, we're not getting, you know. Tremendous amounts of understanding here, but um, I'm sorry, I, that was going on a little bit beyond. Uh, verse 5 said, uh, But they will have to give account to him who, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And for this reason, because there's one who's going to judge the living and the dead, for this reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. And, and the only way that I could. What do you do with that verse? It, it's remember, there's not chapters when this is all written, and we're not far down from this passage of him going and preaching to um, those who disobeyed long ago in the days of Noah. And in that passage, it says he preached to them. In this verse, it says he preached the gospel to them. So we actually have a reference of what he preached, um, why he preached to the dead. Maybe we get a little bit of an answer to that. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body. Um, and and maybe it's because of the judgment. Maybe it's because uh, uh, see they have to give an account to him. And if they had no knowledge, maybe uh, maybe there's not justice in judging them or something. Uh, maybe that's why. I'm, I'm just guessing. <laughs> but. I've long thought about, uh, let's say, the millions of children under the age of 10 who uh, live in the world and don't have an opportunity to ever have the gospel preached to them. Yeah. And a natural disaster comes, a famine, or a flood, or, right. and they're killed. I mean, if we have a just God and they've never had opportunity, uh, then are they destined to the judgment of hell. I've often wondered about that. So perhaps this is an explanation that they'll get preached to as well and have an opportunity. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe there's something to that. You know, a lot of times in, in Baptist life, we say there's the age where you become accountable and there's the age where you're not. And for someone who uh, has been born with the incapability mentally to understand the gospel, um, and they live to the 30 or 40 or 50, but they can't understand the gospel. We, we and I, I won't just say Baptist, but I'd say in Christendom, we, we don't believe that they just get cast into hell because they couldn't understand it. We we believe God has some kind of grace, even if it's not spelled out. And, and is it a preaching to them at another stage where they get an opportunity? Is it an automatic pass because of their innocence and lack of understanding? I don't know the answer to that. I don't really have really scripture. This is maybe the best little bitty place of scripture here, but we don't have a lot to help us with that. Um, so, yeah. But we do believe that our God is just. We believe He's love. We believe He's compassionate. He says He is, and we see it. Um, 
and he does tell us there is higher accountability for what we know. Um, but uh, we, we know that there are people dying who never heard the gospel. And they are going to hell because they've never heard. We're taught to preach the gospel to the ends of the world. That's right. And so um, it's it's a difficult thing. We we don't want people to go to hell, so we go to them and we preach the gospel to them. Um, I don't know what God does with people who never heard the gospel. Who no one ever got to. I don't know. You know, I don't I don't know the answer. It, well, we still we still have to go back on it. Is he a just God or not? You do. So and, and they've never heard the gospel. Then it's just God couldn't condemn them. I mean, that's, that's, well, it's, that's, it's our, that's our reasoning, right? That's, well, and that's my belief. That, yeah. That, that, you know, we're told to go to them, and it's our fault. We don't go to them. And so we'll be judged for that. Right. Um, but the scripture says their blood is on our hands. Yeah. But we don't. But if preach. nobody ever gets there, um, a, government, a government like Myanmar says we can't come in here. Right. Is it their fault that, that their government won't allow them to, to hear? You know, and, and at those stages, I also think that God has other places. We see in Romans 1 that there's a place where people are held accountable simply by creation. They should know there is a God. Well, right? So there's, there's a level where Abraham never heard the gospel. What Abraham heard was a relationship with God, and he believed God. Believing God. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, is righteousness. A righteousness is anyways, righteousness is accredited to you by faith. Um, even though no one's preaching Jesus, you don't understand Jesus, they didn't hear about Jesus, and yet we believe Moses, David, you know, all of them, we believe they are in heaven. The Bible says that Moses and Elijah came down, but no one ever preached Jesus to them. So how do they know about Christ? Some prophets knew He's coming. But there's tons of righteous people who did not know He was coming. But the Bible says righteousness was accredited to them by their faith. So again, we're, we're dealing with mysteries here. But we, we want to use the Scripture to shine light in the mystery and try to understand it. And so we know that faith, uh, if, if for nothing else, if we throw a term out there like that, faith is maybe a, a something that holds the ground for us until we hear about Jesus. <laughs> Maybe that's how it works. Um, but people of faith, well, let me, let me just bring back our Lazarus and rich man story. Lazarus didn't hear about Jesus because Jesus is still walking on the earth. And Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. What made Lazarus get to go to Abraham's bosom and the rich man go into Hades? What made the separation except that Lazarus was poor and a beggar and had nothing, and God had compassion on him, and the rich man had everything and showed no compassion. That's all we get in the story. Now again, we're not given much. We can't, it's, you, we gotta be real careful yeah. when dealing with these kind of subjects about being dogmatic. But what we can do is we can, we can look, we can let scripture shine as much as it can, we can try to understand, but I would, I would encourage you never be dogmatic about how these things work because there's just too many mysteries. I think mean, it's one I love to discuss it. I love y'all sharing verses and we all talk and I think that is fascinating. Um, and sometimes I'll say something and you'll say something and I go, you know what, what I said isn't fully biblical. I hadn't thought of that verse. I need to back up and change what I'm saying. And, and I think that's important in a discussion. Because sometimes we, we're putting a few verses together going, well, I think it must be this. And then somebody will say something and go, hold on. Well, my plan just fell apart. <laughs> i got to back up. i got to add your verse in there now. and Because we got to have it all together. That works both ways. It, it works both ways, <laughs> yeah. You know, because we're, we're trying to figure it out. And we're putting together our plan of how it works. And then yeah. somebody throws a wrench in there. Yeah. But the wrench is the Word of God. Amen. It's a valid wrench. And it should pull us off the track and humble us and make us go back to the Word and say, God, I'm trying to understand it. Yes. But it's hard. We Amen. don't see it clearly. Amen. Um, well, the good thing is, what God wants us to know is made very simple. Amen. Believe in Jesus and ye shall be saved. Amen. And Amen. That's the simplicity of the Gospel. That's right. And we know that the righteous inherit. Right? Oh, what happened? Sorry about the that. The righteous inherit. 
what God calls righteous and what and how He judges, um, that is a mystery. Um, in some ways, in other ways, it's not a mystery. In Revelation, we get some pretty explicit ways to be judges, but how He makes judgment calls and how someone gets into heaven, we know this. It's very clear in the New Testament. You, no one, no one goes to the Father. No one. That means Abraham, Moses, David, you name them. No one goes to the Father except through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? Now that's a verse that we have got to have as a screen of every other idea we put out there. Right? So as we discuss things like this, it's important to have something like that up there that says, all right, no matter what idea we pop up with, nobody goes to the Father except through the Son. There is Amen. no other way. Amen. Right? Nobody. But, is it possible, like he says here, is it possible that for in some cases, like the spirits who died in the days of Noah, is it possible that he sent his Son down and he preached to them? The Bible says he did I can only read what the Word says. That's right. And, 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 and then what it says below, that He even preached to the dead. He preached the Gospel even to those who are now dead. Here's a weird thing. Yeah. Right? This is Peter. And he says, for the, this is the reason the Gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. Yeah. And in that little sentence, and I know it's dangerous to take a sentence yeah. by itself, but... In that sense, it, he's not narrowing it only to those long ago. Yeah. The other verse is narrowing it to those. But in that one, he's saying, for this reason the gospel is preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men. Is it possible what Peter was saying by the Spirit of God that in his day, the understanding was that everyone before Christ was preached to? Maybe that's what he's saying. Maybe up here, he... He just became specific about them, but maybe his specificity up here is not uh, ruling all other dead out. Maybe we, when I read it, that's my first inclination, is that he's ruling out all of the dead but those before the flood, which makes me go, why? But when you go down a little further and he says, for this reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, that's much more general. So, Maybe that's how Abraham and Moses and David and all of them heard the gospel. And those who had believed God would put their faith in. They had faith when they lived and they probably believed and, and uh, entered into the Father's presence by the Son like the gospel tells us. There's no way to the Father except through Jesus. No way. No way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Right? That's right. So, I know I'm going over time. This is an exciting subject. Thank you all for your help on it. <laughs> the more I learn, the less I know. <laughs> That's exactly the way I feel, Jerry. The more I learn, the less I know. Amen. <laughs> Especially on these types of subjects. But they are fun to discuss and, yes, they are. and try. And I feel like I grow in at least yes. the Scripture. Right? I may not yes. be any more confident. Well, it's exciting. But it's exciting. It's fun to discuss. Yes, it is. Well, Pastor and, uh, Chris, I, I've been confused a lot of times about the scriptures that I read and study at home. And then I get here and we talk about it. You know, we read and, and everybody brings up different, you know, such. And it's like, oh, I'm so glad they asked that question. I wanted to for a long time. Amen. So it's very good. Very good. It's good to come together around God's Word and 